very hard to get started after a, an introduction like that because I'm going to be very sober about things now and tell you that a year or so ago I was struck by the idea that I had become a sort of a born-again, itinerant preacher in the field of education. I had confessed the error of my early ways. I had found a better way of life, and I was telling folks about it. Also, I dreamed of wonderful things to come. When I told a friend about this, he smiled, said, don't be too sure. Perhaps you're just a huckster. You really think you have a panacea, don't you? And you're trying to sell it everywhere. I have forgotten my reply, but I did remember Dr. Verpilat. When I was a boy, I lived for a period of time in Madrid, New York. We had never heard of Madrid for several years. One year, Dr. Verpilat came to our town to give a wonderful speech in the town hall, which we all attended free. He started out by throwing nickels and dimes to all us kids up front. Then he told us about his early youth in a great city where he lived a life of sin and shame. He told us how early one morning, after a night of debauchery, he found salvation. I think it was on the steps of some municipal building, he said it was. How he decided then and there to spend the rest of his life working for the good of mankind. Then he told about a secret remedy he had discovered, something in a large bottle. I think he said he got it from some Indians. A remedy that was a cure for many ills. In another bottle, he showed us the tapeworm that had come out of Willie Adams's stomach after Willie drank the remedy. All of us kids knew that Willie wasn't very bright, and now we understood why it must have been a tapeworm that he carried in his stomach. Then Dr. Verpilat let almost everyone in the town hall have a bottle of his remedy for a dollar. Some of the early buyers even got $10 back. <coughs> My father said next morning that the remedy tasted pretty good, but he didn't give any to me. Tonight, I'm going to tell you first about my early vices as a teacher, a college teacher. Then I'll describe my conversion to a better way of life. After that, I'll tell you about the remedy. I discovered some of its effects. And finally, I'll discuss my missionary work, and treat you to a few of my dreams about the future. Forty-five years of my life were spent as a faculty member in six different institutions and, for the most part, as a classroom teacher. In that time, I did many things that I now perceive as evil, of which I feel ashamed or of which I cannot be proud. And they all stemmed from the worship of false gods, particularly John Comenius, 1592-1670, the so-called educational reformer, whom I followed blindly for many years. According to this great Moravian, a teacher should never concern himself with individual instruction. Rather, he should stand before his class on an elevated platform, keeping all the students within his sight and forcing them to pay attention. At the beginning of his talk, he should present his topic briefly in an attractive manner, 
or by asking a set of questions. Later on, within the lecture, he should bring up interesting items and practical examples to engage the interest of his scholars. And he should interrupt his discourse now and then with questions, like, how did I get to this point? He should praise the student who gives the best answer so that others will try to emulate him. Finally, when the lecture is ended, I quote, the scholar will be given leave to ask questions on any point they wish explained. For years, I tried to follow this prescription. I lectured to my classes from a place where I could see each face before me. I gave an outline in advance, or I posed some critical questions. I included amusing items and practical examples. I asked a question now and then to keep my class alert. I summarized when I was done and sometimes offered to answer questions. I did everything that Comenius suggested. There were some things that Comenius didn't cover. He didn't tell us, for example, about the outcome of his teaching, about the distribution of his scholars' grades from A to F, or the number of those who achieved distinction later on, or how they ranked him as a teacher on some questionnaire. The golden age of pupil and teacher evaluation had not yet been ushered in. So maybe I am wrong in keeping and tracing some of my own immoral conduct to his door. Perhaps I ought to blame it on the people who came later in the history of education. However that may be, I did a lot of sinning. Some of my sins were little ones. When I lectured to my classes, for example, I occasionally permitted the impression to be gathered that I knew things which I really didn't. Sometimes, too, I played down issues or made light of problems on which I was really unprepared to speak. And some of the quotation marks in my lectures came to be neglected with repeated use. Nothing very serious. Sometimes when I saw a question coming in the classroom which might disclose my lack of knowledge, I would look the other way. If the questioner insisted, I might put him off till after class, suggesting that the matter was so esoteric or so complicated as to be unsuitable for general discussion. By the time the class was done, he might have to hurry to another. Perhaps I would have thought of a better answer, or I would have found some other method of escape. I lied to my students from time to time. I said that I expected all of them to pass my course when I knew this would not happen. I told them I would like it if they all got A's when I wouldn't have liked it at all. I said that anyone could understand <coughs> excuse me, the content of the course when I knew that there were sections of the textbook that I couldn't understand myself. I told them I would treat them fairly, after which I tampered with the distribution of their grades, making A, B, C, D, F discriminations that I could not possibly defend. I used tricky questions now and then to separate the sheep from the goats, an interesting figure to apply to students. And I denied my pupils the opportunity to defend their answers. Or I used a classroom vote to decide upon the changing of an individual student's grade. There were other things I did of which I cannot be proud. I used histrionics more and more as the years went by. 
and the factual material of my lectures was diluted. I left out more of the hard parts, and I placed a greater stress upon the textbook, even though this meant that I, or at least, or more commonly, my assistant, would have to read it with more care. I introduced more demonstrations, too, within the classroom hour. And I provided outside speakers whenever I was able. The evaluation of my pupils' work was not a simple matter. There were administrative guidelines that I had to follow. There was the good opinion of my colleagues to consider. There was my own predisposition with respect to students whom I knew quite well. And finally, there was the actual performance of the students on the examination. It may be that the letter grades which I finally assigned did not conform precisely to what my students knew about their courses. In addition to my immoral or unethical behavior, I engaged in self-deception. I assumed that I was a successful teacher if 10% of my class received an A, if I sent a student now and then to graduate school, if enrollment in my class continued to be large, or if I came out well on some popularity poll. I closed my eyes to evidence of my failure and I listened avidly to stories told of teachers who were obviously worse than I was. Worst of all was the effect I had upon my pupils. I taught a number of them to cheat, to lie, to steal, to bribe, to wheedle, and to plagiarize on various occasions. I taught some of them to hate the educational process and everything connected with it. I taught a few of them to be show-offish and pedantic. These were sometimes my potential teachers. <laughs> and I led many of them to feel inferior for many years to come. All this I did in the name of service to society, from which when I retired, I would receive a pension and the sunshine of an occasional letter of appreciation which would make it all worthwhile. My conversion from this way of life to one of greater usefulness came in 1963 when I was almost ready for retirement. It came as the result of freedom given by the University of Brasilia to four psychology professors to give up older ways of teaching and to develop something better. One evening, by my fireside in a New York City suburb, exhausted by our efforts to come up with something new, the four of us, the two Brazilians and the two North Americans, experienced a vision, a sort of folie a quatre. We imagined a course of study in which each student could advance step by step through successive elements of knowledge or of skill from the beginning of the course until it ended. We saw him moving at his own pace rather than in lockstep, but meeting our requirements fully as he went along, as shown by his performance on a unit test. When all his work was done, when each unit had been mastered, no matter how much time it took or how many tests were needed, we saw the student as successful, worthy of an A or its equivalent. This meant only that the course requirements had been met. No attempt was made to find what else the student knew beyond that which the course had called for. We saw the classroom lecture in our vision, not as something to be swallowed by the student two or three times weekly, 
and coughed up later in half-digested form, but as something to be used on rare occasions to display the teacher's style in dealing with his subject matter, to impress or to inspire his pupils. No student would be tested on the content of these lectures or on that of any demonstrations that the instructor might provide. In 1964 and 65, our dream was realized in part at the University of Brasilia in an introductory laboratory course on the principles of behavior. And plans were underway for its extension to higher level courses, first in physics, then in mathematics, and to other disciplines and ours. Then the program was suddenly halted by governmental action. 250 or more professors were dismissed or left the university in protest. Our two Brazilian collaborators were among the first. At Arizona State University in 1965, the two Americans of the group had better luck. The dream came true for them in another elementary course of study. Again, it was a one-term, self-paced course composed of 20 units with a unit mastery requirement. And again, the grade of A was given to every student who completed all the units with success. <coughs> Lectures and demonstrations were now and then provided, but the students were not compelled to attend them or to be examined on their content. A new and vital feature of this course was the addition of the student proctor to the teaching staff. Undergraduate aides drawn from earlier classes and under careful supervision were employed to help evaluate the readiness of our pupils to move up within the course and to provide the kind of encouragement, understanding, and direction that were needed by them. The effects of our conversion to a different way of teaching were even better than we expected. Student lying, cheating, whining, and complaining rapidly decreased in volume. Alibis, objections, and reports of unfair treatment were replaced by signs of satisfaction, self-respect, and self-reliance, as well as interest in the subject matter taught. The students reported that they had to work much harder than in lecture courses, but received more personal consideration, experienced greater satisfaction, and achieved a better understanding of the concepts treated. When we met these students in the hallways on the campus or in the classroom where they came to study or be tested, we found smiles and friendly greetings, approach behavior rather than avoidance. As for the teachers of this course, my colleagues and myself, no longer was there need for self-deception, compromise of principle, or distortion of our records. No longer was there need for showmanship or classroom tricks. We knew what everyone else was doing in the system and what was expected of him or her at any given time. We knew exactly what was studied by our pupils and the difficulties with it, ours as well as theirs. We knew each student individually through the unit tests, the proctor's records and reports, and through personal encounters, even when there were as many as 100 students in the class. And we knew our proctors best of all by virtue of our weekly meetings, our daily interactions, and our regular inspection of their work. This was intoxicating stuff for a long-time podium performer. I became a missionary, as did my young companion. 
we began to spread the word of our conversion everywhere, through articles and journals, through papers read at meetings, even from the vantage point that Comenius had suggested. A name was given to the new religion, PSI, a personalized system of instruction, and commandments were handed down to those who wished to follow in our footsteps. Ralph Waldo Emerson is reported to have said, if a man can write a better book, preach a better sermon, or make a better mousetrap than his neighbor, though he builds his house in the woods, the world will make a beaten path to his door. I was certain that we had a better mousetrap. We were living in a desert version of the woods, and I thought that we can now expect the academic world to be the pathway to our door. I was naive. The academic world paid scant attention. There was no pilgrimage to Arizona State to see the magic formula applied. Just a lady from Cuyahoga Community College in Ohio. I wasn't overwhelmed with telephone calls, and I didn't need a secretary to answer all my mail. Except for half a dozen friends, one relative, and some former pupils, no one paid much attention to us. At about this time, the president of the university asked us to talk about our system at a faculty assembly. I might add here that he called this assembly solely for the purpose of letting us report, which was a mistake as far as I was concerned. Everyone came there angry at me to begin with. <laughs> we were to speak at a faculty assembly with an education teacher there as a discussant. I was delighted. I should have been suspicious. Not only could we tell our colleagues how to teach, but we could also make contact with the School of Education. I was sure they would then investigate our project and give us their support. Again, I was naive. The meeting was a non-success. The man from education disposed of us in less than 30 seconds. He said he'd never heard of Joseph Lancaster and the monitorial plan to which I had referred in hopes of getting support from him. Then he talked about some other local projects in which his interest was much greater than in ours. The audience was equally supportive. <laughs> One professor made objection to a careless statement I had made about Mark Hopkins. Another asked if what we were doing was anything like programmed instruction. If so, he said, he didn't like it. A third one, famous on the campus for his wit, asked the name of our control group teacher who had used the standard lecture method so that in the future he'd know where to send his student advisees. My faith in the mousetrap theory was by then becoming weaker, <clears throat> along with some of my enthusiasm for Arizona State. <laughs> but my faith in PSI remained unshaken, so I left the desert scene and went east to seek my fortune. I took my panacea with me, along with Willie Adams's tapeworm in a bottle. <laughs> the Big Brother theory was the next one I adopted in my attempt to convert the world to PSI. This was suggested to me when Professor Sherman, my colleague at Brasilia and at Arizona State, and Professor Ben Green, a physicist from MIT, received support from the United States Office of Education and from the Carnegie Fund Corporation of New York for establishing a center for personalized instruction at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Funds were given to the center solely for the purpose of spreading news of PSI throughout the realm of higher education in this country. The prestige and power 
of these two organizations seemed to me to be exactly what was needed. I felt that it would certainly bring about the conversion of those teachers and administrators who had not responded to our earlier appeals. Once more, however, I was simple-minded. First of all, I overlooked the cardinal rule of all such agencies and institutions. Never support a project unless you can be certain that its failure or near failure can be guaranteed. <laughs> Otherwise, the agency may lose its reason for existence and will have to start all over in some new sphere of benefaction. Now, in the case of research projects, this is easily achieved. This is done by the kind of research design that you will accept. There's no problem there. As for the dissemination of some established good, like PSI, by some institute or center, such as the Georgetown Center, the problem is more complicated, but it can still be solved. You simply ask the center to be self-supporting within a given period of time. This is a sensible requirement on the surface, asking only for the exercise of such well-accepted virtues as competency and thrift. But in order to continue operation, the center must make money. And this restricts the number of those who will get the message, limiting it to those who can afford to go to lectures conferences and workshops to learn about the new system. You can put the center into business, so to speak, and guarantee its failure in achieving the objective you supported. The second item that I overlooked was the establishment itself, the bureaucracy of education, the principal purpose of which is to survive. I did not fully recognize that group instruction and individual instruction call for different supporting frameworks, different dispositions of both space and time, and different functions of both clerical and administrative personnel within the educational institution. Since the older system is the one in power, this means that the teachers who may wish to try out PSI are generally compelled to change the plan in one or more respects to make it fit within the old supporting structure. With each successive tryout, the course may come a little closer to what was there before. It may therefore come as no surprise to you when I say that I've never heard of any course in any university or college that has been taught with PSI in the way its founders intended that it should be. There's always been some modification of the plan, however small, in order to avoid an open conflict at some point within the larger system. This may be related to the fact that the educational establishment, like the Hydra, has many heads, or like the amoeba, it has none at all. <laughs> the, the power exercised by any element of the whole, the president, the dean, the faculty, or any other, is highly overrated. That's what my experience tells me. The would-be pedagogical reformer has no point of entry into such an institution. The dean, for example, doesn't dare to tell the faculty how to teach. Nor does the president. The faculty can't agree, and even if it could, there are the deans and the president to be considered, even the trustees. Also, there's the registrar, whom no one dares offend. The bursar, too. And at one time or another, the students may be heard from. To say this in another way, there is no apparent interface between the technology of teaching and the educational organization it would like to serve. In spite of all these obstacles and others, progress has been made. The Georgetown Center for Personalized Instruction 
has now been in operation for about six years. Its time is running out. It's not completely self-supporting and will probably not become so, although it could attract new money from some other sources. In its lifetime, conferences and workshops have been held. A newsletter has been sent out. A successful journal has been founded. Many speeches have been delivered. Films and manuals have been constructed and a clearinghouse of information on the system has been set up, in large part through the efforts of Professor Sherman and his dedicated staff. <clears throat> it is mainly through the efforts of the Center that PSI is known throughout the educational world today, not just in colleges and universities, but in high schools, grade schools, trade schools, <coughs> military training centers, and in other places. It is known not only in Brazil and the United States, but in every major country of the world. Many teachers have been led to PSI or some variation of it, and some of the users have been influential in getting other teachers to follow in their footsteps. The intrinsic merits of the system, even when diluted, have apparently been sufficient to attract a growing number of disciples, in spite of the obstructions and constraints that I have mentioned. Maybe it was a combination of the Big Brother and the mousetrap theory that did the job. A born-again teacher is likely to have some visions of the future. When group instruction is no longer with us, except in certain cases, such as those of music, and of sport. Excuse me. <clears throat> Where group instruction is no longer with us. I am no exception. I often dream about the consequences of introducing such a system as BSI at every level of education and in every sphere, making use of all we know about the teaching-learning process. What would be the effect on students, teachers, and administrators of our schools, on the policies of admission, on our curricular requirements, on the content and the structure of our textbooks? and on our methods of evaluation and record keeping, even on the structure of our classrooms and our schools? Obviously, I cannot answer all these questions. But my evangelistic status, together with the data that we now possess, enable me to touch upon a few. First of all, I see a student who does not need to be compelled to study or to go to school. These behaviors stem from opportunity and desire. Opportunity is supplied by parents, the community, the government perhaps. Desire is the outcome of challenge and success within the learning situation. Well-planned contingencies of reward lead to willing school attendance, to concentrated study, and to a liking for the subject matter taught. Truancy occurs and compulsion is required only when positive contingencies are weak or absent. I see a student who has never known the meaning of long-term, long-continued academic failure. His skills have been assessed all along the line, and the tasks assigned to him are not beyond his reach. Every step that he has made has been successful, although not always at the first attempt. He has not been passed along from course to course, from stage to stage, with half-completed work, 
compounding ignorance and building up resentment or feelings of inferiority as he goes. I see a student who has never been subjected to invidious comparison with other students or pointed out to them as deserving emulation, who has never struggled to keep up with those around him or been held back by them from advancing, who has never seen his name upon a posted list with a number or a letter showing his position on some arbitrary scale. I see a student who isn't handicapped in academic ways because of his participation in athletic, dramatic, or musical endeavors sponsored by his school because of physical advantages, disadvantage, or of illness, or because of other interruptions. That is, a student who may discontinue any course of study at any point within it as determined by a change of interest, a need for other knowledge, or for any other reason. A student who may return to his course again and go ahead within it after suitable review or other preparation. I see a student who, because of his accomplishments from early childhood on, likes many kinds of knowledge or skill and may readily be turned through available instruction or through the needs of his community, his state, or his nation into any one of several satisfying occupations. Finally, I see a student who, because he has been guided, encouraged, and called upon to meet high standards of performance, comes to like and to respect the field of education and those associated with it. As for the teacher of the future, I see a person with a fresh awareness of the teaching function, one who facilitates the learning process in others, who has examined carefully and in detail the content of his courses, and knows more about their strength and weaknesses than he usually did before. He knows more about his pupils, about the problems that they face and the progress they are making. I see a teacher whose teaching is exposed not only to his pupils and his proctors, but to anyone who may inspect his work assignments, his study questions, and his examinations. His materials may be taken from journals or from textbooks or from co other common sources, but they represent his expectations from his pupils and are open to assessment by his colleagues who may want to start where he left off. I see a teacher who may write a textbook of his own, bit by bit, while his course is going on, replacing parts that do not work and testing out the new, all within the regular working days, rather than in times for rest and recreation. I see a teacher who isn't loaded down with irrelevant or non-instructional duties, such as vocational guidance, personal counseling, occupational placement, or administrative work. A teacher's obligations will be thought of as fulfilled when he has done his teaching. I see a teacher with a greater interest in the technology of teaching, in the practical contribution of behavior science to our understanding of his art. The principles that are applied today, although basic, are of the simplest sort. With further laboratory research, we may expect a finer-grained analysis of the teacher's functions. Finally, I see a happier, better paid, and more efficient teacher who is respected and admired by students, colleagues, and administrators, even parents, not because of his charisma, of his scholarly or scientific contributions only, his qualities as a public speaker or a classroom entertainer, 
but because of his success as a teacher. My vision is less clear when I look into the future of administrative function, the work of presidents, deans, and so on. I do, however, feel quite sure of one effect that individualized instruction, such as PSI, will have upon them. They will no longer need to deal with some of the problems that currently fill so many of their working hours. For example, they will spend less time in arbitration over instances of plagiarism, cheating, alleged injustices of grading, and absences from class of students or professors. They will not be called upon to deal with toga parties, sit-down strikes, panty raids, marches on the office of the president, or dunkings of the dean in the campus fountain. They will not be badgered with, with petitions to change degree requirements, fire the football coach, smoke marijuana in the lounges, hold political assemblies in the gym, play hard rock in the chapel, reinstate some controversial professor, or eliminate the sexual bias in the master's and the bachelor's degrees. These are not the only changes that my, version, my vision of a better world suggests. Courses of study, for example, will differ greatly in the amount of content to be mastered. Textbooks, too, will come in different sizes and will probably have a different format, more flexible to revision. Interdisciplinary study and problem-oriented projects will increase in volume. New descriptions of accomplishment will be needed, as well as new procedures for guiding students in their programs. Rules of matriculation, practices of registration, record-keeping, and tuition payment may be altered. Large gatherings of students will be rare, except perhaps at games and entertainments. Corresponding changes will be made in the structure of the schoolhouse and the classroom in order to accommodate a steady flow of individual students throughout the working day. This dream has been restricted mainly to the field of higher education, so-called. <clears throat> this is where I worked for many years and feel at home, or used to, and which I dare to criticize since I am now retired. But it's not the only area of education or the most important. There are currently fields of elementary and secondary education also, where the need for pedagogical reform is just as great or greater. What would happen if PSI or something like it were employed at every teaching level? We know today that the system will work with children in the earliest grades. And it is said that a project is presently underway to introduce the system or a variation of it throughout the schools of Washington, D.C. K, K through 12, the story says, to 116,000 students. I really cannot believe this. Suppose that every child from the first day of his schooling on was taught in such a manner. How fast would he go through all the current stages? What direction would his studies take once the fundamentals were acquired? What genetic differences would suggest themselves, if any, when equal opportunities for learning were presented? What creative products would emerge when the individuality of each student was assured? What kind of academic leaders would appear within our schools? What sort of citizen would emerge? I shall not tax your tolerance any further with my dreams or with my missionary zeal. When Dr. Verpilat shared his panacea with us, with the citizens of Madrid, on that unforgettable evening back in 1909, he left our village early in the morning. He took his magic formula with him. 
and his tapeworm in a bottle. <laughs> he left many of our families poorer than they were before he came. And none of us kids could see a change in Willie Adams. <laughs> I'm just a little worried over what you'll say when I am gone. Try. I'll try. All right. Uh, we have the offer to field a few questions. Is there somebody who would who would like to ask something? Uh, easy. Um, something you're easy. You're on your own. Isn't that nice for that kind of a statement to come from? <laughs> yes. I never saw her before. I never saw her before. He also brought Dan Johnson here, who was an undergraduate, and we'll probably make a testimonial later. Thank you. Thank you very much. This reminds me of something. I once was asked to speak before a, a very educational foundation. It was, uh, did it, Dan, Danforth? It would it be Danforth, Danforth Foundation, uh, up near the near Lake Michigan, and I went there, and I I gave a I thought a very good talk, and then there was supposed to be the next morning there was supposed to be a panel, in which we would discuss what I had talked about, the uh, night before. Well, there wasn't any panel. There was a gentleman who was more articulate than I could ever hope to be who was wiser than I could ever imagine being, and who had it in for PSI. <laughs> he demolished me and the system practically entirely until a very lovely young lady like yourself stood up and said, well, I understand I think what you're saying, but I took a course that way, and it was the best course I ever had. I thanked her profusely. I had nothing else to say because I couldn't answer him. <laughs> In your vision of the future, you were talking about a university that teaches almost all its courses or all its courses this way. Haven't there been some schools that have set themselves up for that purpose? Yes. You could report on them. I can't report much on them. These have happened, as you probably know as much as I. At College 4 of a, of a of a university in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It teaches entirely by PSI. I know the dean of that college, Toft, I think his name is. Bob Toft, I think his name is. I have never been to the place. I've heard about it, and it keeps on going, which is at least something, but I can't tell you much about it. There's also at the, what is it? Tex University of Texas in the Permian Basin, it is possible to go through the university, a la PSI, uh, or it's possible to go through in more standard fashion, uh, which is related to a question that was asked me this afternoon. Can you have the two work together? They apparently do there. They can go through, students can go through with PSI, and I believe, this I can't say for sure, but I believe it's possible for them, upon the completion of a single course, to move to the next at that time. Now, again, I, I wish, I'm, 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 I'm very sorry that I can't, I don't keep up with things very well. I can't. I live in Aiken, South Carolina. I never get any news <laughs> from anywhere. That's the best I can do. There may be other places. I pray there are. We had a Department of Physics. At, at, uh, at Brasilia, where it was entirely uh, PSI. I don't know what happened to it because they lost a lot of teachers too in that uh, uh, explosion down there. Yes? Uh, I'm in, in engineering, and I advise a lot of students to take some astronomy courses in physics. Uh, and uh, is 
done by what we call the Keller plan. Uh, I've never gotten used to PSI because that's pounds per square inch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, psi is the, is, the, is the symbol for psychology. And I felt very self-conscious when, when I got that PSI there. Everybody goes for some kind of an acronym these days. And I thought, that's very good. Now they'll say psi, and it'll be lots easier than personalized system of instruction. And I never liked personalized well, anyway. I, I think that'd be an excellent move. Uh, yes. But that leads me to a, a yes. basic question that I have, and that is that you let off your talk uh, with a list of the sins that you make. And I confess I, too, am a sinner. Yes. And I think I'm able to match you uh, sin for sin. <laughs> would, you, <laughs> would you come down? <laughs> yes. Go ahead. I wonder if you could uh, 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 comment, though, on how you can uh, lay this. I, I do not know. Uh, I have to refer to my wife's notes here. Uh, uh, Comenius, of whom I'm not really familiar. I wasn't. Yeah, I found it in a book. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but uh, when you explain that, you know, his method of teaching, uh, it sounded, you know, that's excellent. You know? <laughs> it was. And, and here you were tonight podium and you have everybody's attention and you heard every word yes. that you said and it was excellent and I heard no sins committed and then after you talked about Cornelius, then yes. you laid out these sins. Well, you know, I, th I think I've learned something in giving speeches. At first, I used to talk about PSI in a way that sent people to sleep and they learned nothing. I finally decided that I ought to make it more like a sermon that I ought to deal with things that are extremely, that everybody will surely understand and repeat it frequently. And just kind of get in there and, and, and be inspiring, tell little stories with it, and people would pay a lot more attention and would keep awake. They might not learn as much, but they would be incited to look further. And I think maybe that's the way a lecture ought to work now. That's, I, I don't, I think it is more like, I, I, I really begin to think of myself as a kind of a, as a kind of a, of a preacher. You know, you, you make it simple, and so many people will understand. I didn't, that's not a criticism. Have to be laid to uh, well, I tell you, Comenius, I, there was a man, I got an office when I went to Arizona State. They gave me an office that had, been, that had been occupied by an education professor, and he had a lot of books that he left there. And one of them was called The History of Education. I've forgotten by whom it was written. But I, I looked into it, and I, I, I saw pictures in it, and I stopped, and I read the, under the pictures, and I read about the monitorial plan by Joseph Lancaster. I read about Andrew, somebody else, uh, and, and, I, and I read about Comenius. And it gave a list of all those things that I mentioned. And this is what he prescribed in 1638. He said, if you do it this way, that's the best way. Never do anything individualized. Teach to all your students just like this. And I taught just exactly like that. And I was doing the best I knew how to do, but I wasn't very effective. I think now that I was a failure, but it took me quite a while, quite a while to come to that conclusion. I resisted it as, as long as I could. I doubt, sir, if you were a failure. <laughs> well, it depends what you're comparing me with. <laughs> it, but. But now, now I think I was a failure. I think I could have managed eight out of eight or nine out of ten, rather than one out of ten, with a degree of understanding that I got then, because I had a very select group of students. They were selected from the very upper crust of the of the high school population and the prep school population, and even with all that lovely selection and the heredity and everything that went with it. I only got about 10% of them that got up to the A level in my course. And that was year after year. And it wasn't they weren't motivated when they came in. They appeared to be. They lost it very soon after they got in, I guess. But anyway, they should have done better. And I think I would do better now. I would say with that same group now, I'll get 9 out of 10. <laughs> and they won't all know the same degree. Because kids learn more than, than, than you teach them about the course and about the, the subject matter. You know, we know that. They learn more than that. And on any, anybody's estimation, 
some other person's estimation, they may be better. But in terms of meeting the requirements of the course, they were there. And I would now give them full credit. I would not try to estimate anything beyond that, not for the benefit of Phi Beta Kappa even. Yeah, the answer is yes. But I think what we ought to do is to start earlier, and they would find many more satisfactions in other places than attempting to go to graduate education. I think if we taught many things, if many things were taught with success in either direction you go, there'd no longer be the, the feeling that I failed to get up there. I chose to do this. I decided to do that. I preferred this. I think we would eliminate a lot more failures to go on to our people who desire to go on to graduate school, if we gave proper education and, 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 and filled, I think many jobs are just as good jobs in the world as being a PhD and teaching, or whatever one does now instead of teaching with a PhD. <laughs> but but, but I, I, I think that if we did have no discrimination of the sort that says you're in a lowly occupation, because you couldn't make it in a better one. I think things would be a lot different. Maybe, maybe we would choose different things and go in that direction or in some other direction. Why should we necessarily feel that we must go where some elite little group would go? Or maybe only a few would want to go on to graduate, what we call graduate school. That's a guess. I don't know. I can't. Of course, I can't answer your question.